like you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to picture this person in your mind's eye. What does this person look like to you? This person graduated from high school, first in their class, valedictorian. This person scored a perfect score on the national graduation exam, an exam required for entrance into college. And this person wanting to study medicine scored the highest score of everyone in the country on the medical entrance exam. What does this person look like to you? Keep your eyes closed for just a moment longer. Now I want you to picture this person in your mind's eye. This person also graduated from high school first in their class. And now this person is about to graduate from university in the top 10% of their class, and they already have a job. They've got a, a job where they're going to be working with elementary school students to ensure their academic success. Now open your eyes. How many of you picture the medical student looking like this? And how many of you picture the university student about to graduate with a job working with elementary school kids looking like this? For most of us here in the United States, Africa is invisible. Our media tells us almost nothing about what's happening in Africa. And if we hear anything at all, it's typically very negative, right? The words that often come to mind are words like dark and dangerous, starvation and poverty. And then there are the leadership issues that are unfortunately all too common, issues of ethics and morality greed and corruption with, among people in power. Add to that a long, long history of billions of dollars in foreign aid and charity that never seem to make much difference. When will we learn that Africa does not need a foreign rescuer? Africa does not need Americans or Europeans or the Chinese saving them from their plight. Africa, Africa, on the other hand, is looking for people who will walk alongside them, work with them, encourage them, and open the door to equitable opportunity. There's a Kenyan Rwandan word that I've really come to love, and that word is Ubuntu. Loosely translated, Ubuntu means I am because you are. And you are because I am. It's a word that emphasizes our shared humanity, our interconnectedness. It's a word that emphasizes our need for each other. So what does this word Ubuntu have to do with equitable opportunity? Well, from my perspective, the more we understand and appreciate our shared humanity, the more we understand and value our interconnectedness, then the more committed we are to equitable opportunity because, because we recognize that we all benefit when there's equitable opportunity for all. I can't be fully human unless you reach your full potential. And you can't be fully, uh, fully human unless I reach my full potential. We're in this together as part of our shared humanity. In the African mindset, the collective community is in many, many ways more important than the individual. And I know that's hard for us Americans to understand because we value rugged individualism and picking ourselves up by the bootstraps and doing it my way. But the very essence of Ubuntu is this collective commitment to one another that recognizes that if we help each other and if we work together and if we open the door to equitable opportunity, then the whole community is stronger. I first came to Africa in 1983 as a linguist. 
It's a long time ago. In those days, there were no cell phones, no internet, no computers. The only way I could communicate with my parents was by snail mail, and it was a six-month turnaround time. All right? I was sent by a U.S. nonprofit to, to live in a rural village among the Akajic people in the southeast corner of Nigeria, close to the Cameroon border. And I was there because Akajic was, at that time, only a spoken language. And it was my job to, to learn the language, analyze it scientifically, develop the alphabet, grammar, and dictionary so that the Akajic people could learn to read and write the language of their hearts. And even though I had been sent by a U.S. nonprofit, the tribal chief and elders made it very clear, very quickly, that this was their project. I worked for them, not the nonprofit. I was there to walk alongside them, lend my linguistic expertise, and work with them to successfully complete this project together. Those early lessons learned were what made me fall in love with Africa. Right? Those early lessons profoundly shaped the way I've worked ever since, serving and supporting communities, helping them to achieve their goals, not mine. I have the privilege these days of leading a nonprofit that works with young leaders, works with university students in Rwanda. We educate and equip the brightest young leaders in Africa, equipping them to and empowering them to uh, cultivate thriving communities. And one of the things I've learned is that all too often, the brightest young people with the greatest leadership potential are invisible. They're hidden away in rural villages, in refugee camps, in post-conflict communities and poor villages where no one sees them and no one recognizes their potential. But the moment the invisible becomes visible, the moment these young people are seen and given equitable opportunity to the university education they could only dream about, Great things happen. Let me share some numbers with you. About half of the students in our program lost one or both parents in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. In that genocide, over a million people were horrifically murdered in just 100 days. This genocide is second only to the Nazi Holocaust. We have several students who are the only surviving members of their entire families. About 20% of our students have grown up in refugee camps, living on just 25 cents per person per day. And unfortunately, in Rwanda, only about 16% of high school girls actually attend high school, and only 3% go on to university, which is why we work very hard to make sure about half the students in our program are female. But these numbers share only part of the story. Here are some numbers that share a much more positive part of the story. 97% of the students in our program graduate from university, and half graduate in the top 10% of their classes. And 93% of our students get paying jobs within two years of graduation, when the national statistic in Rwanda is only 41% of graduating students get paying jobs. In fact, 60% of the students in our program get great jobs within six months. And these students have faces. And I want to share just a couple stories with you this evening. I want you to meet Giselle. Yes, you saw her photo earlier. Giselle was just two years old when the genocide occurred in 1994. And so her mom and dad, her older sister, and her baby sister and herself tried to flee the chaos and the murder and make their way into neighboring Congo. And somewhere along the way, mom and older sister got separated from the other three. And dad and Giselle and baby sister kept looking and looking, but never found them and finally gave up, assuming they'd been murdered. So they continued into the rainforest of Congo, and that's where they hid for weeks. And they lived in a refugee camp for a little bit, and then they moved into uh, one of the rural Congolese villages. And dad was so distraught about losing his wife and older daughter, he felt that he had to just go back into Rwanda and try to find her, or at least find out what happened. So he left Giselle and her baby sister in the care of a Congolese woman. And unfortunately, he never returned. Most likely, he too was murdered. 
And Giselle says from that moment on as a seven-year-old girl, all she could think about was getting back to Rwanda. But she couldn't figure out how to do that. And she became eight and then nine. And at the age of nine, the women in this Congolese village said, wow, Giselle, you're almost old enough to get married. Mm -hmm. And she started hearing stories about the marauding militias that would come in and kidnap nine-year-old girls and 10-year-old girls and marry them off to their soldiers. And that's not the future that she wanted for herself or her little sister. And so one night at the age of 10, can you imagine it, at the age of 10, she waited and she took her little sister by the hand and they fled out of that house and they ran away and they started making their way for the Rwandan border. And it took days and days and they had no papers to get across the border legally. So she said when they got there, just waited till it was night and then they dashed across the border. And it was days again before they came to another village. Huh? 10 years old and eight years old. And they got to this village and they started knocking on doors, begging for somebody to open and help them and feed them. They were starving. And finally a man opened the door and he gave them food and water and he asked their names. And when Giselle shared their, their names, this man gasped. Miracle of miracles. It turns out this was an uncle. And he thought they were dead. Thought he'd never see them again. And even more miraculously, it turns out mom and older sister were still alive, living in the next village over, and they were reunite, reunited the very next day. But the story goes on from there. Giselle desperately wanted to go to school. She'd never been able to go to school. And mom kept saying, oh, it's too old for you to start school now. Besides, you're just a girl. But Giselle kept begging and begging, and at the age of 13, her mom finally relented. Can you imagine being a quiet, shy, 13-year-old girl sitting in a classroom for the first time with six-year-olds? In that first year of school, she completed four years of education, and she never looked back. Yes, she graduated valedictorian of her high school class. Yes, she scored a perfect score on her national uh, graduation exam. And she scored the highest score in all the law on the medical entrance exam. In this spring, she's finishing her third year of medical education. And here's Nicholas. Nicholas was lucky enough to have both of his parents survive. Yeah, we saw his photo a little earlier. Both of his parents survived the genocide. But unfortunately, his parents divorced, and Nicholas was just a little guy who went to live with his dad, and his dad eventually remarried. And then Nicholas's life became a nightmare. His stepmom refused to feed him because she hadn't given him birth. And she physically abused him and emotionally abused him, and unfortunately, dad just looked the other way. And it got so bad that Nicholas ran away from home and lived on the streets. He became a street boy for several years. And yet as a young teenager, he decided he wanted something more. And so he figured out how to go to school and make it through high school. And then he came into our program. And yes, he is about to graduate this spring. I get to go celebrate his graduation here in a couple weeks. And he's graduating in the top 10% of his class. And he's been hired by a nonprofit. He'll live in a rural area. He'll have a portfolio of 80 primary school kids that he gets to love on and support and make sure they're successful in school. He gets to do for kids what was never done for him as a kid. And he's so excited. Giselle and Nicholas are just two of the more than 100 wonderful Rwandan, Burundian, and Congolese students in my life. All of their stories are inspiring. None of them required a foreign rescuer. All these young people needed was access to equitable opportunity so that they could become these emerging leaders bringing powerful, practical, amazing transformational change to their communities and their countries. And this is true no matter where we are. No matter where we are, all too often there are people who are hidden, who are invisible, whose potential we don't recognize. And yet when the invisible becomes visible, when we recognize people and see people and recognize their potential, when we're willing to walk side by side, when we're willing to work hand in hand to open the door to equitable opportunity, when we're willing to live Ubuntu together, then together we can have a huge impact on our communities and our countries.
Thank you.